My name is Jennifer Martelli, and I'm a member of the writing committee at the Salem Athenaeum. We're delighted to host eight writers, all with roots and connections to the Athenaeum's many writing workshops and salons. Tonight, you'll be hearing poetry, fiction, playwright, and memoir from authors who are true literary citizens. We encourage you to follow the links in the chat to buy books and to cheer on these talented writers. Thank you, Carolyn McGuire, for monitoring the chat. And if there's time at the end of the reading, we will open for a brief Q&A. And with that, we ask you, please mute your mics. Our first reader will be Kali Lightfoot. In 2010, when Kali Lightfoot signed up to audit a poetry class at the University of Southern Maine, she had no intention of becoming a poet. Yet, 12 years later, she has an MFA in writing from Vermont College of Fine Arts, a published book of poems, Pelted by Flowers, and is working on a second book, as well as writing reviews of poetry books for the Broadsided Press. Kali. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> and thank you, Athenaeum and Writers Committee for this opportunity to share some poems with, with you all. I wanted to start with one, um, actually it's called Requiem, which sounds like an end, but it's really a beginning and, or not even a beginning. It's sort of a, a weird ars poetica for um, writing poetry. Requiem, a few words heading toward a line born at the stoplight on Derby Street. It was a quiet little idea. My eyes fuzzed over and I could read it there in that thinking place where lines scroll by at odd moments. No pen from the passenger seat, no scramble for a scrap of paper. I thought, I will remember this. And I did recall it for a while. The light turned green. I played with the line and its follower as I turned onto Lafayette Street spied a meter in front of Weiner Brothers Hardware, parked and locked the car. But my shopping list stepped up and asserted itself, scattering the still tentative little collection of words, now lost for good, behind a plug for the sink, two screws, and an ironing board cover. I don't know about you, but I've been thinking a lot about traveling lately because I haven't been able to for so long. Um, and this poem is from a trip to Greece um, back in, I guess, 2010. The only thing you need to know is the word ela, which in Greek means, come on, or hey. This is called donkey riding on Lesbos. This little beast, 45 in human years, carries me without complaint. Rhythm of four feet, strange at first, beats counterpoint for the two feet I'm used to. Teetering on a scrap of saddle, I finally, I finally square without thinking, rocking in time to sounds of her hooves on hard pan trail. No jets scream overhead. In fact, no motors at all compete with the wind or the shouts of Aries, the drover. Ella, Ella, Annabelle, Ella, with burr of tongue and lips that seem to say, I see you munching flowers there, get back to work. I suspect he chirrups at us too. Ella, Ella. Sit straight to the front, hold on the reins. We could be walking anywhere in time among a thousand shades of green that stretch across once violent hills to the Aegean. Ghosts of invading Turks or Persians might even now be standing under olive trees below us, swords raised, waiting for our swaying line to blunder and to reach. Annabelle, oblivious to my imagined dangers, plods along unconcerned, dreaming of toasty, tasty blooms. 
Her ears snap at Aries, his chirps and showy irritation. Released by rhythm of hooves and voice, my mind reaches lazy over a gate, finds the latch, and floats above a garden, green hills, olive groves, the sea. And those were from Pelted by Flowers, my first book. And these are, are some that might be in my second book, maybe. This first one is um, sort of appropriate to our very unsettled season that should be spring, but never is. <laughs> it's called Before There Were Weather Forecasts. And the, the title goes right into the first line. Before there were weather forecasts, we humans looked for mare's tails, clouds, and mackerel skies, noted wax and wane of rheumatiz, listened for peepers and katydids, watched cumulus stack up or drift. We gazed without thoughts of intelecasting, stalled pressure systems or radar towers. We ambled foraged and tended flocks under whims whimsical clouds. We lived in the unmapped paths of hurricanes that arrived unnamed. We squinted after nightfall into darkness, sniffing the wind. Oops. And this comes from the vegan period in which I decided to become a vegan. The, I mean, sorry, the pandemic period when I decided to become a vegan. And thinking about being a vegan made me think about, wait, what about the plants we're eating? They're alive. What about the other living things we kill? So this is a poem called Dead Things. Wooden kitchen cabinets from oak trees sacrificed to hold my dishes and flour ground from wheat. Cinnamon dried from inner bark of cassia trees killed to flavor pies. Mulled cider, morning oatmeal. Flax, its fibers harvested for linen dish towels. A bowl of sea pummeled seashells sits on the back of the toilet, residents gone to aquatic predators. Leather couch. Would the cow have died anyway for steaks, pastrami sandwiches, burgers? I, human, apex predator, surround myself with dead things that I think I need. I am not the gentle soul I believe myself to be. And this is a pandemic poem, I have to admit. A real pandemic poem, not a vegan poem. <laughs> um, and I wrote it last April and it was really a pandemic poem at that point. And this, and by this April or March now, it really um, has broadened out into more of a, a thought of a grief about things we really can't do anything about, pandemics, wars. And I'm sort of dedicating it. My brother died about a month and a half ago too, um, caused by pandemic or caused by the pandemic, by the coronavirus. So um, this is New England, New England April amid the plague. Still in bed, I draw despair around me like a coverlet, sun rising on the no-name tree outside my window, its leaf buds fat with frost. Oscar the cat, curls tight against my leg. Basement furnace thumps an unsteady beat. How many days before I can shut it down? 
I want to stay sad so I can write about pain, but I have nothing to say. Instead, I think pancakes and some bacon, call brothers to Verna, or eat Cheerios from the kitchen island while I stand alone in a vinyl planked sea. I roll over, hold Oscar's left hand foot, hind foot, and pet his toes. Thank you. That was lovely, Kali. Just wonderful to hear your voice. Um, and I'm glad that Oscar made an appearance. <laughs> Our next reader is Kala Penchera, who is the author of No Day, No Dusk, No Love, One of the Similores, and Bewildered. She is a poet and prose writer whose work has appeared in many journals, including Poetry, The New England Review, Iron Horse Literary Review, and Carolina Quarterly. A high school English teacher, Kala lives in Raleigh, Massachusetts. Kala. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, everybody, for turning out tonight. Happy to be here with all these readers at the Athenaeum. Um, I'm going to be reading the opening and then one scene from a piece of autobiographical fiction that's part of a collection that will be published next year by Loom Press. It's called Penny Count Your Blessings. The winter I was 16, we milked over a hundred cows. The only one who'd kick you was Penny. Why do we keep this cow, I said dodging another of her attempts. Reach in, my father said, stop daydreaming and keep your head out of the way. I had always daydreamed plenty, but now at least one of those fantasies seemed within reach. Armed with a shopping bag of college brochures, I chanted the promises of university life. Go from the ordinary to the unexpected, discover new passions. Standing in the pit of the milking parlor, Utter level with two rows of cows, I thought, one of these days. Now it loomed, the time I would be done with cows, especially cows like Penny. Only my father would have kept a cow like her. Though most cows' udders hang like upside down hearts, four teats pointing toward the ground, Penny had teats like weather vane arrows. No milking machine hung on her without its seal leaking and making a racket or falling off altogether. With Penny in the milking parlor, you couldn't rush down the line dipping teats with iodine the way you did with any other bunch. Instead, you extended your arm to touch her hock with your finger. Once she got the kick out of the way, she'd stand, leg trembling. The knock your head off your shoulders jolt came if you surprised her. My father, of course, feared nothing. You're always in a hurry, he'd say, shoving me aside and putting the machine on her. He warded off her blows with a bare arm, pushed her leg back to the ground. You got a date or something? High school boys are really attracted to girls who smell like cow manure, didn't you know, I said. Nothing wrong with hard work, said a man who'd never wanted anything else. Besides, why be like all those other girls? Because, I thought, those girls are the kinds of girls to whom boys keep their promises. Penny swatted me with her tail, left a trail of manure across my cheek. Please, Dad, I said, let me call the truck for her. Can't get rid of the ones that milk, smart girl. Just show the cow who's boss. He squeezed my arm where the muscle should have been. You've got to toughen up a little, honey. You think it's going to be easy out there without your daddy to protect you? She might have been crazy, but Penny was unfailingly fertile. When she came into heat that spring, we let her into the milking parlor alone. In a makeshift chute, her escape blocked with several iron gates, a standard two by four kept everyone else still, but the year before, Penny split that in half before anyone touched her and ripped her knee open. Penny panted and strained. I climbed up on the outside of the chute, leaned over the bars and pushed her against the wall. Behind her, my father gripped a hollow rod a plastic sleeve on one arm up to his elbow, a syringe in his teeth, even though she repeatedly tried to back over him. Finally, he moved one of the gates behind her and maneuvered his arms through its bars. 
Did you ever read the story of Ferdinand the Bull, I asked? Instead of reading me books, my father told me stories when I was young. I made him keep talking until I fell asleep because I was afraid to be the only one awake in the house. He told and retold tales until he was sure I was out. Well, Ferdinand only wants to sit under his cork tree all day, I said, although my father had not answered my original question. I explained how the little bull got to Madrid and sat down in the arena so he could smell the flowers and the ladies' hats. He was too sweet to fight. Those are the kind of genes we should be using on Penny. You always got your head in a book, he said through gritted teeth. Well, that's a good quality, right? My father muscled the cow over with his shoulder. It'd be a real good quality if you could hold her there for one goddamn minute. We had a young bull who ran with the heifers. It might have been safer to turn Penny out for a day or two with Martino. He wasn't mean yet, but he was amorous and persistent. He might be the only one who could wear Penny down without getting mortally wounded. But we'd have to figure out how to get Penny into the heifer pasture first. We could also call the breeders cooperative and have them send over a technician to breed her. But even my father, that questionable businessman, realized the insurance risk that would be. Penny quivered then crashed back against the bars, pushing my toes off my perch. Keep her still, my father hissed, the syringe still clamped in his teeth. I climbed back up, stretched farther across her body, thrust more of my flimsy self into her. With his free hand, my father lifted her tail. She jammed my shoulder backwards, smashed my other fingers between herself and the metal bars and knocked me off again, this time on my rear end. My elbows scraped concrete. Cursing, my father flung open the office door and, re and returned with the nose leads. Once he pinched the soft pink meat inside her nostrils with them, Penny trumpeted. Other cows would have stopped moving. But Penny reared, threw her shoulders into the barn wall and shattered a pane of glass with her head. My father, shards glittering in his thin hair, wrapped the rope around a post and said, hold this now, try a little. She kicked out behind her, missing his knees and bloodying her own shins instead. She whipped her tail about his arms, my neck, bald and shot snot, but my father reached up to his elbow inside her, then slid the plastic rod in and shot the semen through with the syringe. Penny bellowed. He peeled off the sleeve, filthy with manure, and unclamped the nosebleed. I once asked my mother why we never had the birds and bees conversation. You grew up on a farm, she said. You saw everything you needed to know. In this context, my lack of a social life seemed a blessing. Well, that's that, I said examining my abrasions. Penny's issue will flourish for another generation, thank God. Some cows had to be bred several times before they conceived, some never conceived again. But I had a clear picture of Penny's lunatic egg cuddling up to one lucky swimmer. See if you can let her go, my father said as he stormed off. This was the man who only ever hurried through milking so we could ride the Ferris wheel at the fireman's carnival. Out harrowing fields in April, he'd stumble upon early wildflowers and pick me a bouquet. Penny twisted beside me, drool streaming in silver strands. He and I used to like each other, I told her. What's all the fuss about anyway? How could Penny not know how lucky she was? Someone shoveled up after her. She ate heartily, even though the grain bill was overdue. I reached over and swatted some glass off her shoulders, pulled my hand away before she crushed it. So she was ugly. It wasn't as if she was going to have to sit home without a prom date again, even if she'd finally gotten this peaches and cream complexion. She had a hundred or so sisters to pal around with so she didn't have to be lonely or move a couple hundred miles away in the hope of making some friends who didn't consider her house a field trip destination. Penny's shoulders twitched. She marked me with a bug eye. No, I said, you get to stay right here where he'll look out for you. You going to let her go? Are you gonna to talk to her all day? My father said as he marched past me on his way to the calf barns. When I yanked the gates away, Penny bolted, bag swinging, shit spraying for the open door. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Kala. That was just wonderful. I feel like I know these cows. It's coming from somebody who did like not grew up completely opposite <laughs> somebody who grew up on a farm. So it's, they're just wonderful stories. Our next reader is Gregory Glenn. Gregory is a writer living in Massachusetts. He is a former poetry editor for Soundings East. His poems have been published by Poetry Soup, Drunk Monkeys, Mass Poetry, and he will be one of five poets featured in the forthcoming anthology, Nine by Five, due out in spring of 2022. Gregory. Hello. Um, what more is there to say about me? Not very much, uh, but Here's some poems for you. Um, thank you, uh, everyone, for for coming and and for the Athenaeum for producing this. And and Jen, thank you very much for for booking me and and the other readers in this. Um, I'm glad uh, that that we just heard a story about inseminating a cow that ended with shit spring everywhere. Um, because I'm I'm gonna try to ratchet it up a little bit. Uh, this poem is called Catch Up. With apologies to Warren Schulberg. Uh, who is a contributing writer to um, Forbes. <clears throat> Our cat does this thing where he gets on the bed and he bites the comforter. Well, actually, it's more accurate to say that he delicately pinches it between his teeth because the rest of what he does with it, I suppose, at least to him, is very tender. And so I am reading this article about Sears and Kmart in Forbes magazine, which uses words like incredible and woeful and alarming to describe the declining number of Sears and Kmart retail locations in America where they had at one time each been its largest retailers. And the cat is giving the comforter his love bite and he starts kneading. He just goes crazy, kneading, purring, snarling, staring ahead at me and kneading. I used to think it was some kind of leftover nursing behavior from when he was taken, maybe prematurely from his mother, which I know sounds very sad, though it probably saved his life. But what's sadder to me is how clever people get when they write their own biographies and how this practice now extends to outlets like Forbes magazine, as if analyzing and documenting retail stores unironically is artful or compelling or necessary or actually I remember one time standing in South Station I heard someone on the phone talking about someone they knew in accounting who they described as being a rock star in their profession as if rock and roll had anything to do with it as if rock and roll had anything to do with anything anymore and that's I guess where we've arrived at we'll put ketchup on anything and call it food and expect and sometimes demand that people eat it. But the reason the cat bites the blanket like this is because when cats have sex with each other, the male bites the female's neck to induce a latent reflexive response in the female to keep her still. Like when a cat picks up a kitten by its scruff, it is actually a defensive maneuver on the part of the biting cat to make sure that neither cat gets hurt. And so that's what my cat is doing. He's fucking the brains out of this comforter and he does it all the time. And I don't know why, and I don't know what it is about the comforter that's so sexy to him. And I don't think I want to know either. Even the part of me that wants to know does not want to know. And so I finish reading the article and I look up and the cat is finished fucking the blanket and he's licking the ghost of his balls. And I say, isn't it just unbelievable that with everything going on in the world, that someone would want to write something like this, that they think that anyone would want to read something like this, that they would think that this would be important enough to share with humanity? But here we are. Um, nobody fucks in this next poem. It's called Spice. I can't remember when Leah got the 20 ounce jar of onion powder, but it's empty now. There was just enough left for one last dinner before it got retired. We've had the same round of table salt for I don't know how long, but it feels like what must be years. Maybe it couldn't be, but it just might. Its spout has been missing for about as long as we've had the round itself. It was so frustrating, so hard to open and close, refused to settle into its groove in as pleasing a way as I'd have liked. And so one night I just tore it out, fixing it by breaking it, I suppose, and sating the logic of my temper. 
And now standing by myself in the kitchen, I wonder if maybe there were any spiders that crawled into the container and died. Or did they crawl in and lay some eggs there and leave, the hatchlings pouring out in our sleep some night? Or maybe sometime when we were out buying oranges, they all left. Or is the spider living in there still and trying admirably to just remain anonymous, listening to me, listening to all of this? Oh, Christ, I hope it doesn't feel sorry for me. This next poem is called The Blender. I've been worried about my hair lately, so I've started making smoothies most mornings, and we got this blender that is a quiet blender because apparently I can't handle the harshness of this world. Anyway, I'm making a peach smoothie one morning, and the blades of the blender won't catch the ice at the bottom of the pitcher, and so I take the pitcher out, and it unscrews, and milk and shit leaks everywhere. The first thing I do is get mad at the cat, and then find a towel and start mopping it up. I shake the pitcher and try again, still no dice, no smoothie. And at this point, I am beside myself furious with the cat and jamming a knife down and in and out of the pitcher, trying to break up anything frozen and basically performing the function of a blender, albeit not very well, but still somehow better than the blender itself. And so here we are. And at this point, I'm starting to die a little bit, but I don't really notice it until after I finally get the blender to work. But before I can have any of the smoothie, I am dead. Now the cat can jump up onto the counter and drink the smoothie, but I'm not mad about it because I am dead and because everyone who is dead is at peace. I am okay with it all. And St. Peter is there with a couple of administrators and St. Peter welcomes me and I say hi and thanks and St. Peter says this isn't the kind of place where we can let just any schmuck in off the street and I nod and St. Peter says we need to make sure that everyone is of the right temperament before they go anywhere and I nod and St. Peter says good so long as you get it what's the angriest you've ever been at a kitchen appliance? And I feel myself go cold. And St. Peter raises his eyebrows a bit expectantly, a bit mockingly as if to say, hmm, and the administrators start softly to chuckle a bit. And St. Peter hushes them, Shh, shut up, shut up. And I look at them and I shrug and St. Peter says, well, let's look at, uh, have a look at the tape then, shall we? And I shake my head, no, no, but he starts it up regardless. Though to my relief, it isn't the blender episode. It's something from a long time ago. My roommate's toast oven. I was too stoned to figure it out. It's all a great relief until the tape ends and even St. Peter is laughing now and he flips a little switch. And so here I am as a baby set to do this all over again, which some folks might consider a gift, but I'm pretty sad because the cats and Leah and the smoothie are all in a life somewhere else in the world. And it will take a while to find the words to find them, but I might forget about all of that in the process of finding the words. This poem is called Big Bird Singing at His Father's Funeral. I don't know how to be like Big Bird singing when he sang at Jim Henson's funeral, how to hide the obvious human inside of something obviously very much more obvious. How do I suspend your disbelief that I'm there, that I'm here? How would my ability to misunderstand help you to understand? How could my childishness be put to some use? I don't know if I know how to teach or to entertain. I don't know if my green but growing handle on letters, colors, numbers, and time could be put to use maybe. I really don't. Please don't lose your patience with me. Try to let me act it out. Let me close my eyes and make up a prayer, even if I'm only just feeling sorry for myself a little bit, or even if it's only crib talk, the kind of talk we talk with God, secret, alone, and in the dark. Grown-ups pass outside the room, speaking softly as they do, trying not to wake us as they go. I don't know. Whatever is sad, let it be sad. Whatever you think you have, think that. Sometimes it's hard to feel like you have something. Sometimes everything feels sad. Sometimes it feels like you're a great big yellow thing and you have to do something you need to do, but you not want to be seen. And you wonder, maybe you hope, they don't see you here singing, yet you wonder if he can't hear you down here singing like that. Um, I have one last little one, if that's okay. Am I good? Okay. Um, this is one I've been sitting on for a little while. It's, uh, it's a response to a poem that JD wrote, and I don't think I've had the opportunity to share it um, for him. So this is called, Thanks for Taking Care of Me. 
I'm having this dream. I'm a barber. Santa Claus walked in and said for me to start trimming his beard. And so he tells me that they say before we die for about 30 seconds, it might actually be that our life flashes before our eyes, like you're having this dream. And at the moment, at least they believe that it's all or mostly happy memories that our brains are showing us. And then Santa laughs, looking at me in the mirror, and he says to me, you know, you're always thinking about your past. All you ever do is remember. How would you know the difference one of those times you're lying there in bed, staring at the light from the window on the wall, unable to recall if it was from a memory or a dream, this room you always think about, its smell, its details, all coming apart, dimming as the afternoon moves along and the lights go, and you drift along too, falling asleep. And it's the last thing you know. Thank you. Thank you so much, Greg. It's just wonderful to hear you read. And I haven't heard you read in a long time. So that was a real treat. Really great. Thank you so much. Hannah Larrabee adores the earth, the night sky, the city of Salem, and pretty much everything Oliver Sacks has ever written. Me too. She and her partner tried to manage a small farm of animals, including two dogs they chose and four cats that chose them. Her book, Wonder Tissue, won the Airlie Poetry Prize. Hannah. Thanks, Jen, for having me. Um, I hope everyone is buckled up because I'm going to take it down a few notches with my poems. So just to be uh, upfront about that. Um, I'm going to start with a poem from um, a pandemic anthology that Lily Press did, and I think Jen has a poem and a few others in here had some poems in there. Um, Poets respond to the pandemic. So this is uh, that feeling about of being disembodied um, by the pandemic, and for me also just like deeply entrenched in the earth at the same time. So this is called One Theory. If the same dandelion sprouts again in the same field, the honeybee might recognize its sweetness, but will never know. The firefly flashing in front of your face is the same one you see now in the plum tree. I speak of earthly things with such a fierce nostalgia. I replay the losses, memories, stubble of pumpkin vines, my father's propensity for silence. I was not ready for such memories when I used to touch everything. Now touch opens great fissures in me, one person kissing me, touching me, intricate as tangled roots. I have been careful not to take anyone to bed who I do not want to remain in some way. I don't think I will ever be okay with the temporary lending of atoms, the porous and unstructured body of desire. Just once I'd like to rest with my full weight dissolving into the bed, the grass. Are you interested in one theory, one body, one death, one saturating feeling? I never considered how many frogs sing from the vernal pools at the ache of spring. To me, it is one song. And I have never needed my body to come back to me more than I do now. It could walk from the fields around the corner of the barn straight into my arms. Um, and I was thinking about <clears throat> Salem and I, my love of Salem uh, and trying to capture it somehow. And I was thinking this poem is an older poem, but it's in Wonder Tissue. Um, and it kind of captures that subterranean feeling, I, I guess I would call it. This is poem to my car when I'm not in it. All I can think of is how quiet it must be as I look out from the kitchen window. It must be nice for you to know that I've left without knowing I'll come back. I can tell from inside that the night rain falling under street lamps feels good to you. Like early December snow, everything feels good to you. Especially when I'm somewhere else doing God knows what, and you are in some parking lot feeling sun or wind, feeling good alone, not understanding loneliness. When I come back, sometimes I find spider webs across your windshield, paw prints across your hood. I used to feel close to my first car, but then again, I used to feel close to many things and now only rarely. Some night I'll fall asleep in your back seat after staying to watch the cat walk across the hood, the spider rise and drop across the windshield. And when I'm asleep, I'll hear something knocking and I'll whisper, who is it? And reach for the door only to find the places your doors have been no longer have doors. Who is it? 
who's there? I'll ask again, my eyes closed, my hands groping, but there were never any doors, never was any knocking. Better not to confuse something lost with something taken, says the spider suspended, says the cat watching me now from a nearby tree. Um, <clears throat> the first time I was ever in the Athenaeum was actually for a sound classical concert. Um, so it's kind of a memory I have of it. Um, and so I picked a couple more poems to read tonight that have sort of a music uh, feeling to them, or at least engage with some sort of classical piece. Um, this one is called We Have Decided to Bomb Syria, which I'm reading for pretty obvious reasons, I think, today. But it also does um, engage with a classical piece, piece by D David Byrne, actually, um, called Dirty Hair. So it's not essential in the poem, but there's a part where in the middle of the song, it, the, a violin sort of hovers in call and then the rest of um, the strings pick up. So this is, uh, we have decided to bomb Syria. I felt alone the day Anthony Shadid died on horseback. His clenched lungs echoed now in the broken wombs of cities, crumbled stone, bone work, and ash. It is a faraway ache like a dream. Think of how comfortably we move into the safer rooms of ourselves with the stillness of monks set aflame. But we can't step into the yard that is not ours, not even here among neighbors. Listen, one violin is invoking the others. It lingers living voice of hair and wood. And the others must respond to something so beautiful. They must all break in unison and they do. Then we are here in Syria. I open my mouth and no dust clock collects inside. I think of the summer night sky boom of distant fireworks, the smoke backlit, the climbing magnitude. What if those were bombs? I am that far from war and no one will talk to me about this feeling. The voices in the rubble, the ones that eventually go silent, who acquires them? Who moves to speak and instead cries for help in the middle of a supermarket, stands shocked in the immaculate aisles of despair? Let yourself be that music, let yourself die. As a rule, all energy exists and can only be displaced. Right. I'm gonna read another one from Wonder Tissue. <clears throat> this is called On the Nature of Daylight, which is a, a piece for strings by Max Richter. This is the language of strings. Why must it hurt? A sailor adjusts to the woven seas, but never to the way the stars seem to touch the dark horizon. The truth is we are temporary. This is the language of strings, how temporary. I love you in the thread of each touch, the circular stain of your coffee cup. You take my arm. I come closer and orbit a hundred year comet burning, burning through the sky. This is the language of strings, I love you in the wordless passage, the cellular decay. This is the language of strings. It moves through the field of wheat and I touch it all. The infinite small as your hand inside the glove. And then just one last poem. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna read from a chapbook um, that are all letters to Teilhard de Jardin, who was a Jesuit priest and paleontologist, but really it's um, a whole book about climate change, I guess you could say. Um, this is called Dear Tehard. There is a feeling of all things changing in unimaginable ways. Isn't it strange then that she and I should be so bold this waking hour, eating rosemary and salt wood-fired bagels, walking leisurely through a farmer's market when the ocean, far from this palace of lakes, becomes asthmatic. Strange for an ocean to acidify. Strange to think of our human bones collected and observed in fossil beds when we were once so distant from the schools of fish, the curved ferns, the petrified wood. Now we are saddled to the beast of the earth and give it commands. It collects them in its teeth. We think ourselves safe among the trees, but not even the trees are safe among the trees. Last week, I prepared a grave for the possum I observed for many months. 
It died beside my truck, perhaps knowing that I would carry it off, offer it into the shade, the cool earth. The gods used to weave our fates, but then they left the looms in warehouses overtaken by tech startups. Maybe you find them. Or maybe the tapestry is the sky leaning closer to better observe our imbalance. The moon is a lover backing away slowly. The door is one we thought never to open. If something comes, it comes slowly, slowly enough for me to bury what was once a friend of good intentions, of mutual scavenge, the city sparrows summoning us awake or asleep. It is hard to explain it to my heart, but if my heart is a thing reaching, a thing summoning the earth now with a shovel, then it also is a winged thing and a nest of leaves, and it is still breathing into this world. That's all I got for today. Thank you. Oh, Hannah, thank you so much. It was wonderful to hear these po those poems. And uh, yeah, it's a, this is a great way to listen to writing because we have all different levels of emotion and voices. So it's, it's very moving to me. Thank you so much. Our next reader is Fred Krell. Fred is a retired psychologist who spent decades working in the residential treatment of children. Since retiring from clinical work, he has been writing about many of those experiences that shaped his development as a clinician. Fred. Thank you for inviting me. Um, a few years ago, a few years after World War II ended, my family moved from New York City to rural Park Ridge, New Jersey. Like Jews everywhere, my parents were emerging from years of seeking information about family who had been unable to find a single country that offered them refuge from the Holocaust. My mother's cousin, Dina, was the only survivor of her immediate family. She had just recently been allowed to immigrate to the US. When she came to live with us, I was about 11. Dina lived in Witebsk, Belarus, a disputed region between Russia and Poland, where she had been a teacher and a high school principal. The Germans occupied her town and immediately created a ghetto into which about 16,000 Jews were herded. Shortly thereafter, the massacre of the ghetto began. No one knows how many people were murdered. The Germans kept Dina alive and moved her from one concentration camp to another because she could converse in four or five languages and was useful as a negotiator among inmates from several countries, as well as between inmates and guards. Dina was eventually liberated by the Red Army and moved to the safety of the Feldefing DP camp in Bavaria. The US Army had opened that facility to house Jews freed from the camps, as well as those found abandoned in locked crack cattle cars at a railroad station south of Munich. Though she participated in a gathering of former ghetto residents in Munich in 1948, she was not allowed into the United States until 1952, the year that Anne Frank's diary was published in English. I do not remember bringing Dina to our house in Park Ridge. She slept in a small room on the ground floor, not far from my parents' bedroom. A clothes sewing machine table served as her desk. Our dog slept in the kitchen and occasionally woke everyone if a raccoon or skunk wandered into the yard. My brothers and I shared the two upstairs bedrooms and were told to behave normally, but not to ask Dina about the war. I had heard enough about Europe and Russia to know they were not good places for Jews, even before the war. I was sufficiently aware of concentration camps 
to know there were terrible places and Dina had been in more than one. Her naturally black hair had turned white shortly after she was imprisoned. She and I dyed it very black. Dina was nice to me and smelled of baby powder. My mother spent countless hours sitting next to her cousin at the dining room table, preparing correspondence and making phone calls. My parents frequently spent whole days driving Dina into New York City and back to meet with various agencies, doctors, or other relatives. Late at night, I would sneak downstairs to talk to Dina after everyone was asleep. I could see her reading light under the door. On my first or second visit, I asked Dina about Europe and the war. I don't know if she told my mother about our meetings, but we had many such talks with her in bed, covers pulled up to her chin, and me in a chair at the foot of her bed. She always seemed happy to see me. I never saw her cry or look upset about anything. I don't remember Dina telling me what happened to her parents and her brothers, but she talked easily about being forced with other women to assemble communication cables for the Germans. Before pulling the heavy rubber sleeve over the bundled wires, as an act of sabotage, they cut some of them and inserted pieces of cardboard in the gaps. Another Jewish prisoner in her work group threatened to tell the guards what they were doing. Dina and two other women killed her with tools from the cable shop. In answer to my question, she said, no one got in trouble. After several months of being part of our family and working with my mother, Dina's restitution payments from Germany began, as did her paranoia. She soon convinced herself that my parents had helped bring her from Europe, obtain needed services of all kinds, and had her live in our house only to steal her restitution money. My father became frustrated with Dina for being unappreciative of my mother's efforts on her behalf. And it was decided that she should move into an extended stay hotel in New York City. I don't know if Dina wanted to go or if any other relatives offered to take her. After that, I saw Dina at our house only for Passover, a bar mitzvah, or to bring her food and help my parents clean her room. I don't know if they ever learned that their guest had committed a premeditated murder fewer than 10 years before moving into our house. I recently made some unsuccessful internet searches to find out when and where Dina died. On a European trip after college, I went to the Anne Frank House and Annex in central Amsterdam. I drove to Dachau, the first German concentration camp, only a few miles north from downtown Munich. I later visited the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC and Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. In downtown Budapest, I sat by the shoes on the Danube bank, a memorial to the thousands of Jews and other undesirables shot by members of Arrow Cross, a right-wing Christian political party. The bodies of the victims fell or were thrown into the river. The site is out in the open and less than a thousand feet from the Hungarian parliament buildings 
that lined the riverfront. It was not a secret activity. Dina's nighttime stories undoubtedly contributed to the disturbing fantasies I have in synagogue. I see the other congregants as naked, cold, starving and frightened adults and children being herded from place to place, surrounded by barbed wire. That no one came to rescue them still haunts and angers me. Something similar could happen again. Witnesses are fewer and fewer. We need to remember. That's it. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Fred, for that chilling and very timely uh, piece. Thank you so much. Our next reader, uh, Peter Sempieri, is a director, playwright, songwriter, and puppeteer. He's a proud member of the Dramatist Guild, the National Labor Union for Playwrights, and an associate professor of performance and directing at Salem State University. Peter. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, that was incredible, Fred, and I was deeply moved. So Fred, thank you for that. Uh, and I just wanna say that I don't think I can hold a candle to any of these other writers. So I'm a little uh, embarrassed or shy about sharing my work. Uh, this is a monologue um, uh, that I wrote in 2012. It's a response to a, a solo show that was actually featured on This American Life that was an expose about uh, labor factories in Shenzhen, China that manufactured iPads and iPhones, which later came out that the author had fabricated a lot of many parts of the story. Um, and I was actually in the middle of memorizing this monologue and performing it when I found out. Um, so it's kind of like a monologue within a monologue, a solo comic thing. And it's about truth and lies uh, and ethical consumption. And there are swear words. Um, and I talk fast, so if I have to slow down, please let me know. Here we go. So fuck you, American media. Daisy was right. I'm standing behind that brilliant fatty right now. I learned that all the media and consumer pressure on Apple helped to move along labor negotiations a little, but these stories about the real people who make our iPads and iPhones were few and far between in those four months of the Daisy backlash hysteria and for months after. Most in the media world and online gossip communities seem like they'd rather talk about Daisy's sin of lying instead of acknowledging the brutal truth of the bigger sin, if you believe in sin, I guess. I don't anymore. I'm a recovering Catholic. And then I realized this, this lying to ourselves about lying, about the real world ethical shitstorm we're all responsible for. This, by the way, this is my new religion, obsession. And even though it's the middle of summer, I feel the color begin to leave my face. I'm a ghost floating around the streets of Peabody on my bike. I stop at mega, mega corporate coffee shop to get my favorite $4 espresso drink. I take one sip. I feel the caffeine soak into my tongue. And then I can't help thinking about the poor Colombian farmers who picked the beans, see their backs bent in the hot sun, the wrinkles on their arthritic hands, feel sick to my stomach, throw the thing in the garbage. Then I feel guilty for wasting the $4. And just like the book of Daniel, I begin to see the writing on the wall. I have been hung in the balance and been found wanting. I need to be more mindful. I need to know where everything I eat, drink, consume comes from. I start reading the labels of everything. The trip to the grocery store to get milk and eggs for my family takes two hours as I compare the carbon footprint of truck travel from a cage-free organic farm in Duxbury to a cage-free organic farm in Brattleboro. I know, I know. First world problems, stuff white people like. Lower down on Maslow's pyramid of human needs, I'm sure I wouldn't have the time, money, or energy to care about such things. These thoughts don't give me any comfort, though. The obsession worsens. I start sorting through my electronics, trying to determine which of my many useless devices were made in sweatshops by near-slave labor around the globe. Here's another excerpt from Mike's show that flashes into my mind. Foxconn is the biggest company you've never heard of, or maybe you have. 
Foxconn makes almost 50% of all the electronics in the world. So if you're ever wondering how much of your shit comes from Foxconn, just take all the electronics you have in your house, put them together in a big pile and cut them in half. That's Foxconn. I have to get all this shit out of my house. And for all those of you out there feeling morally superior right now and thinking, well, la di da, I don't own an iPhone. I have a Droid, Razor, slash Blackberry, slash Samsung Galaxy, and I don't, no, just no. The way that most people deal with living in the modern world is to lie to themselves all the time about these things. I deserve this. I do enough. This phone wasn't made with slave labor. It's a coping mechanism. We can't deal with these moral gray areas. Our brains would explode if we were completely honest with ourselves about everything we use, touch, eat, wear. So we tell ourselves little lies every day to cope. We're all liars, remember? You, me, Mike, Daisy. Well, Daisy wasn't lying to cope at first, not at all. His lying, it's called theater, was used to stop people from lying to themselves and coping. But then he was asked to put it on the news as factual news. And he got caught about it and got a chance to come clean. But what did he do? He lied about lying. That part I don't get. Why did he lie after the fact? I think I might have a vague idea. The accepted definition of pathological lying, according to the Journal of American Academy in Psychiatry, is, quote, falsification entirely disproportionate to any discernible end in view. The individual may be aware they're lying or may believe they're telling the truth, being unaware that they're relating fantasies. Now, there's been an ongoing debate about whether or not this is actually a compulsion or a disease. It has not yet made it into the DSM, but some prominent psychologists link it to borderline personality disorder or even narcissistic personality disorder, which was added to the DSM-4 in 1994. It's defined as, quote, a pervasive pattern of grandiosity in fantasy or behavior, a constant need for admiration, and a total lack of empathy. Why does that sound like everybody I know? Why does it sound like me? I start rifling through the house, digging in old boxes in the attic, conducting my tests, going through my mental checklists. Do I really need this salad spinner? Can I avoid buying a new one? Can I swap this for something I need? Can I build one? Where was this cassette player from 1987 made? How are the people involved making it treated? Were they paid a fair wage? Where are the profits going? I must unplug from the digital world and return to the analog one. No more things that aren't made by human hands in a way I can understand. I start purging. First, the iPhone, of course. I throw mine off the Salem-Beverly Bridge in a ceremonious act of ritual cleansing. I start donating old machines, wires, cords that I make sure are recycled properly, once trendy sneakers with questionable origins. I start sharing, reusing, Hey, dude, so I was thinking we could split a year's subscription to Mother Jones and then, like, use all the back issues to build a go-kart out of paper mache. I start trading. I start making and growing. First, it's tiny cuttings of my own fruit and vegetable plants and recycled milk and egg cartons on the back porch, then brewing my own beer in an old fertilizer bucket, then cultivating my own yogurt in a cast iron pan. Hell, I even start fermenting my own kimchi in putrid little glass jars. I don't even like kimchi. My wife, Jill, and I have a two-year-old son. We use cloth diapers. We share one fuel-efficient car. Jill makes at-home cleaning products from vinegar, lemons, and water. She makes her own dish soap. We don't buy our bread. Jill bakes our bread. And then I commit the unthinkable. I was reading an article in the Atlantic about blood diamonds and I realized that when I bought my wife's engagement ring eight years ago, I didn't ensure that it was ethically sourced. Honey, what if we replaced your engagement ring diamond with a conflict-free cubic zirconia and donated the profits to the African Relief Fund? My wife burst into tears. 
But I see that moment as it happens as a tiny blip in my overall moral cosmos. I have attained a humane and just worldview. I am floating again, this time on a cloud of ethically sourced mist. The cleansing is complete. I have washed my hands of global guilt. I no longer touch objects that are not made or grown by small scale companies through a co-op using fair trade, organic, GM free, sweatshop free, eco friendly energy saving methods. I am organic -er than thou. I'm so guilt-free, I can come weightless. Lifting high in the clouds, I see all of the North Shore laid before me. As the lies of the digital world fall away, I float higher and higher and begin to notice portals in time. I discover teleportation. And now I don't need a bike or a car to get around. Like St. Francis of Assisi, I bi-locate from one home to work, from work to home, bamfing like the incredible nightcrawler through my bloated multiverse. All I need to teleport is to imagine a simple analog action, turning over a turtle. I turn over the first turtle and I look beneath and at work near the copier, I notice the shoes one of my colleagues is wearing. I know that brand and I know they're assembled by the tiny hands of Cambodian children in Phnom Penh. He sees me staring and says, are you okay? I meet his eyes and I smile my ever knowing smile and I just walk away. I turn over the second turtle and I'm in class and I overhear two of my students complaining like, do you have an idea how long the showers have been broken in March since yesterday morning? Do you realize I haven't had taken a shower in like 18 hours in my hair and I vomit up? Do you have any idea how many gallons of water we waste a day in this country taking showers while there are infants in Liberia dying of dehydration? They just stare. And I go back to quietly taking attendance. I turn over the third turtle and I find myself with a friend at a sushi bar. She's about to order her favorite, a maki roll of bluefin tuna. And I can't help myself blurting out, you do realize that bluefin tuna is one of the most unsustainably sourced fish on the planet. You really shouldn't order anything on this menu that isn't line caught. I turn over a turtle again. I'm at the local toy store with my son, Mateo. We're shopping for his second birthday. He wants out of the stroller, of course. He wants to explore on foot. So I set him loose, like an eagle hawk hunting a field mouse from across the table. He zeroes in on his prey, a small bright yellow box of happy little dinosaurs, which he grabs off the shelf and lifts up. Dinosaurs? For me? Pleasant? Okay, yes. I snatch the box out of his hand, sniffing it, inspecting it. I know the company. We bought Teo, an old-fashioned wooden train set dyed red with organic paints made from beet juice. The box looks good. The cardboard is recycled. The proof code says it's made in the USA. My son looks at me, his little blonde curls twisting up in anticipation. I realize that to him in this moment, I am a god, able to determine the fate of his happiness for the rest of this day and probably every day after, since he has no concept of past or future. He stares and waits, his huge brown eyes sparkling like a Pokemon from the 1990s. I put it under my arm and say, okay, Teo, you can have this, but we're going to have to wait until after we blow out your candles and we have birthday cake to play with it. Okay. Later the same weekend, we're playing with the little dinos and he's caught on to the fact that each one of them is different and he has different names. And so he's asking me and he's pointing, what's that? Now, my deep study of paleontology from third grade science is a little fuzzy, but that's called a triceratops, son. Ceratops, what's that? That's called a dimetrodon. Metrodon, what's that? That's an ankylosaurus. Ankylo is Latin for armor, ankylosaurus. Cleosau. And then he pulls out the last little dino, probably the cutest one of all with a little smiley face, the brontosaurus. What's that? And I'm about to answer, but I remember that this one isn't called the brontosaurus like it was when I was a kid anymore, that scientists discovered it was a different species or some shit or rebranded it or something so it would get better ratings. But for the life of me, I cannot remember what they changed it to. My careful cogitation for the correct species does not impress my son. What's that? He bellows clenching his fists, his whole body shaking in anticipation. He grabs the dino off the table. He turns it upside down, holds it up to me, feet in the air, asking the question. And then I see etched in tiny boss relief letters on the belly, a patasaurus made in China, 2010.
Thank you. That's my piece. I'm sorry I went a little bit over the time. That was great, Peter. Thank you so much. I I felt seen in parts of the world. It's really, that was fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Um, our final reader tonight is Karen Kapoor. Karen's latest book, Women in the Waiting Room, was a finalist for the National Poetry Series. She's the winner of the Antivenom Poetry Award for her first book, Visiting Indira Gandhi's Palmist. She serves as editor at the Beloit Poetry Journal and teaches at Amherst College, where she is director of the Creative Writing Program. Karen. Oh, thank you so much, Jen. Um, what a lineup. What can I say? Um, this is an amazing range and I'm very happy to be part of this neighborhood. Um, so much wonderful talent here. Um, I'm feeling the turning of the season um, very strongly. I was out today in the backyard and finding all the little things coming up from the ground. Uh, so I thought I might read some things I don't usually read, uh, but which are some ways related to spring. Um, I'm going to start with a poem from Women in the Waiting Room about a somewhat troubled garden. The Annunciation. It will come down to he said, she said. The color of sunlight and shade. What could be heard from the street? Whether the spider lilies were still blooming. The great I am spoken by one, swallowed in silence by the other. Many times a day, she will try to think of lying there. His shadow crossed over her, but will conjure nothing. Other times she will wake with the feel of a tongue wet in her ear, though she sat for hours on the shower floor, scrubbing her face away. Behold, a word of witness. So much went unrecorded between the girl and the angel. Did it pour down like honey? Did it sting? The soul, whatever that is, struggles to articulate. She can go, she can still go to that place where nothing grows, where her mind has nothing in it. And only breath ties her to the world with a blue hair ribbon. The movement of the soul towards articulation is slow. No official complaint has been recorded. It is known she was clutching a book, that through the whole ordeal, she kept one finger in the page. Behold, a word of holding steady, in the mind, in the eye. Later they will ask, why didn't she drop it, use it to push him away? No, it was not the first time she had been in his garden. Yes, willingly, she may have claimed to be his. It felt good to be held until she felt nothing. Spring. Then through the window, I could just make out a cormorant, immobile on a buoy, head high, wings fully open, a totem black mark against morning. I was about to turn away when it shifted, twisting, slipping into the water, first otter, then eel. A moment later, I could have sworn a girl with dark hair surfaced. No time to blink and the bird was back, swallowing prey, pressing its wings to the sun. I watched to be sure it was real a bird who can escape, change shape after shape, who can become a girl eating a river. I've been two selves at least, two creatures, each hungry, each trying to slip away. Bad luck, bird, snake, girl. Can the sun burn from my chest what chases me? The last garden um, related poem here. Um, this one was inspired by a line of Sappho. Somewhere here. The one with violets in her lap. 
flower that can hardly whisper. The prettiest thing about a girl is her silence. A line broken centuries ago, scrap of verse of girl, such loveliness broken again in time. Imagine a corsage, a cloche, a petal pinned to her shoulder under the chandelier. Imagine an empty garden. Dirt and silence are what it takes to grow a girl. So quiet she can be written down alive, a vase of what happened to the one with violets in her lap. What survives, survives as fragment. Part of my uh, spring enjoyment has been the river um, that runs near my house, the Merrimack. Uh, and this poem is inspired by that. Let me be as a river. Nothing but motion, muck mouthed, mud hearted, brackish, all dirty at the lip with rise and fall that exposes hull gouging stones. No curiosity about source, no knowledge of destination, just willingness to bear anything right to the end. Silver as fish skin, one hour wrinkled, two hours smooth, duck fouled, trash choked, silent, then gossiping under a full red moon. Let me be dredged when the leggy girls go missing, used for a slow cruise, churned for speed, reeking of the unseen ocean or veiled in the scent of pine trees, a fog in the head, then clear as the tip of a pin. Enough beauty to draw blood, enough anger to strip the banks, enough fullness to carry the pleasure boats high. I'll finish with one um, last poem, a new poem, also in a garden, to the grackle. Indecent bird, lovely as an oil slick with wings. You've called me to the summer garden. Tin cans of light are crashing through the pear tree. Trash, umble, globe bracked. Come kiss my ass. That's how you sound, how you rash bird can lure me. Can I keep coming back to the garden if I'm called? There's a man I love and a boy who will be a man whose bones I still feel click and thrash where I put my arms around him just this morning. The lash of your voice tells me I should call my loves while I can to listen to the grackles croak and clack in a nest built with half a ramen cup. They tumble out into the yard. For a moment, two tall figures stand twitching like the stuck hands of a clock. Then crude slash of sound, boy or man or you bird, sends them swooping and dashing through panicles, perennials, old blackberry canes. Let it always be this way, noise summoning, mustering us together to search out the brash mother who curses and flashes her wings. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. It, it was just wonderful to hear you read those, uh, those strong evocative poems. Um, so I don't think we have time for questions, but all the readers, if you look in the chat box, uh, there's lots of love, lots of love uh, for all of you. Um, I want to thank all of our readers, Kali Lightfoot, Kala Pinchera, Gregory Glenn, Hannah Larrabee, Fred Krell, Peter Sempieri, and Karen Kapoor. And thank you too to Carolyn McGuire and the Salem Athenaeum. Could we unmute for a minute just to uh, give everybody a round of applause because you all deserve it. So, yay. Yay.
Thank you all so much. Thank, thank you everybody for coming in. Uh, please support these and other local authors. Uh, please visit the website Sal salemathenaeum.net and discover our lecture series and events and writing programs. Um, and that, so thank you. Thank you all. This was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks. <laughs>